Right. Well, good morning, everyone out there. Uh, welcome to the Midwest Payment Partnerships first uh, webinar for the 2023 calendar year. Uh, we're, we aim to try to do these quarterly. Um, this year, uh, or this session, I should say, uh, to kick it off, we've, we've got a good program uh, lined up for you. Um, today, we are going to be talking about uh, our payment management data and how we can use that payment management data uh, to help with your preservation program. But before we get going, um, we have a quick little poll that we would like to take just to kind of understand uh, who we have in attendance. So when, when that poll pops up, please go ahead and answer that. I guess Patty, let me know when it looks like we got a fair number of responses in. Okay, we're eighty-two percent right now. Fifty percent are state or provincial agency, three percent local, forty-one percent industry, and nine percent other. Excellent. All right. Um, well, since we have such a large state and uh, product. For vocal providence um, uh, group here, I, I guess I wanted to throw out one more quick reminder that uh, Midwest, if, if you are a Midwest state or providence, um, just a reminder that the data task force is also uh, seeking your input on the cost uh, database. Um, Nicole Andres sent out an email a while back the uh, due date for that is February 20th, but I believe we'll still be accepting information beyond that. But uh, just mark that on your calendar. If you haven't had a chance to submit that information, please, uh, please do that. We, you know, it's a great resource for, for all of us. It allows us to kind of check to see what's happening across, um, you know, across the, the region. And you can kind of compare uh, compare prices uh, and help you estimate projects if you want to try a new fix. Um, but all right, without further ado, we will kind of get her underway. Uh, like I said, we've got we've got three great panelists for you today. We've got Tyler Hunt from the Michigan Department of Transportation. Um, we've got Allison Lara from Saskatchewan Highway Administration. Highway Ministry. I'm sorry, and then we got Chris from Hepin County. Minnesota, and I will let them do a more formal uh, invite, uh, introduction to themselves. So with that, uh, Tyler, take it away, sir. Thanks, Rob. Uh, like Rob mentioned, my name is Tyler Hunt. I'm the Capital Preventive Maintenance Program Engineer for the Michigan DOT. Um, I oversee our payment preservation uh, project statewide, um, basically planning and and construction coordination, those types of things. So um, I have a background in maintenance operations. That's where I came from previously in our operations field services division. Um, I made the jump over about a year and a half ago to this position. Um, so I'm still learning. Uh, it's been great and enjoy what I do. So are we doing presentations of the others or am I just gonna go ahead, Rob? Or... Just no. your, it's your presentation time, so. Got it, okay. Thank you. So with that, um, I'm gonna jump into the presentation then. Uh, I'm essentially gonna be covering a few steps on how MDOT uses data uh, for um, template planning, project selection, and specifically what we do in payment preservation. So I think everyone has seen this graphic many a times, I'm assuming for those that haven't. Uh, this is our, our goal for pavement preservation to be on the green line there. Um, maintain, keep good roads good is more cost effective than letting them fall to uh, major reconstructions. Um, so the challenge is always, how do you identify that ideal age uh, there at the bottom for a surface seal or when is it time to do a rehab um, and how to coordinate all that? So the answer to that is many, many factors, but 
data is one of the biggest. Um, so I just wanted to note that there's many project selection considerations. I'm sure lots are aware, but um, I'm going to be covering a lot of the underlying ones briefly, but there's a lot of things outside of data that we utilize, um, especially in the preservation program, <clears throat> such as local acceptance of the treatment. So people don't want chip seal on bike routes, things of that nature, um, safety considerations and others. So, um, so that list there is, is what I'm going to be covering in this presentation. Um, so I wanted to start at a high level um, and where does MDOT use the data and kind of a breakdown on, on the steps um, that we utilize it in. So um, the first level on the top is a network level. We use a software called Road Quality Forecasting System. Um, and that, that software helps us determine um, where our network is Currently, um, we break it down with deterioration models um, and how the, how the pavements perform and how they deteriorate. Currently, we're doing a one-year deterioration on our remaining service life, which I'll get into in a second. Um, and then that, at the network level is where our program projects are and kind of our, our strategies going forward. So um, that top level uses a lot of data, high-level data. Um, the next level down is strategic level. Um, that's where we're kind of figuring out where we should focus our efforts for future work. Um, and we utilize the, the RQFS software for that as well. Um, so there you can see we break it down into, there are many um, work types, but the, the major uh, pavement ones are rehab reconstruction, which is our very heavy work. And then the preventive maintenance program where we're doing pavement seals and what we call functional enhancements, um, which is, basically single course overlays or um, concrete, concrete patching, um, that type of work. So <clears throat> from there, um, the next rung of the data and where we use it at is the, as at the project level. So that's where we're actually determining the fix, um, taking into consideration other data types too, such as traffic, um, PCM data and project history. Um, so just to look at what we what we get from the network level data from our road uh, road quality forecast system, um, we best basically get a look at our network high level and good, fair, and poor roads uh, MDOT. So our we we utilize um, RSL for determining uh, the status of our roads rather than good, fair, poor. Um, we define RSL as the number of years before a major rehab or reconstruction will be more cost effective than preventative maintenance. Um, and so you can see our goal there of 90% uh, good roads in Michigan and um, our, we've been tra trailing off and we continue to trail off in future years um, due to lack of investment um, or lack of budget. I mean, not lack of investment. So, um, so that's the network level data, how we look at it and what we use it for. Um, the next level down, like I said, was the strategic investment. So um, from RQFS, we determine strategies for investment type. So how much money should we put uh, from each of the templates uh, into certain regions and certain uh, roadway segments. So it helps us break down where to focus the, the funds um, at a high level. And then from there, the next strategic thing is to look at the individual templates. And this is... Um, monies that are a breakdown of the budget for capital preventive maintenance um, and we determine which category to focus our money towards payment ceiling functional enhancements um, and some discretionary funds so we're trying to move the needle so to speak on the condition of the roadway um, by by directing our regions to invest in certain paving types So the project level, uh, we're getting down to that level, low level, right at the job level, um, and that's determining the fix. So we have a CPM manual, uh, MDOT, it's a, it's a really great manual. It goes into detail on um, all the fix types we utilize in the program. Um, like I said, the remaining service life is one of the big ones. Distress index, which is a, um, a sunset uh, index that quantifies the level of surface distress. Um, that exists on a pavement section into a composite score. We utilize that. As of 2018, that is sunset, so we're, we're developing a new um, index currently. Um, and we also use the standard PCM data 
um, rough, rough, roughness index, IRI, um, rut depth, and then of course traffic data, project history, and a big data point in my opinion is uh, engineering experience um, to determine project selection. So. Oops. So back down to the project level, um, just wanted to give an example of kind of what we what we do for for selecting preservation treatments. Um, we have a whole a list of different preservation types um, in the CPM manual, and we break down the appropriate uh, times to utilize those treatments uh, based on uh, traffic or uh, PCM data, RSL and DI. Um, so we give the table there of the, what the minimum remaining service life of the pavement should be before you uh, consider a chip seal, um, what the DI should be, the IRI and rutting. Um, there's also a lot of good write-ups in there on, on where we should focus it according to the ADT levels, turning movements, that types of things, and uh, engineering judgment, of course, so limited turning movements, um, things like that. The next project level use of data example I wanted to give was crack seal. I think this is a good one um, for MDOT specifically. Uh, we currently do region wide crack sealing contracts and we proactively seal uh, many lane miles of our pavement every year. Uh, the CPM manual gives uh, a breakdown of when to use the route and seal versus over band method. Uh, basically, you can use uh, cracking data for that and in VI. Um, there's also crack density criteria. Um, that we use for, for selecting routes that get the crack ceiling. And then uh, uh, basically we say you need a remaining service life of 10 years. So let's not crack seal old neglected roads that are gonna get a reconstruction soon um, to better invest our dollars. Um, so yeah, similar to the, the chip seal, but getting right down to the nitty gritty uh, of data utilization. And with that, that's all I have. Um, I guess, are we, are we going to wait to do questions at the end, Rob? Or, sorry. I'm gathering a list of the questions, if you can hear me. And uh, at the end of it, I'll go ahead and go through the list of the questions. And then, of course, uh, if it's questions directed to a particular panelist, uh, we'll take those at the end. Okay. Cool, uh, you can hear that, me. Yep, that's the uh, end of my presentation, so thanks. Okay. Rob, why don't you introduce us to the next person that will be presenting for me? Rob? Oh, great. Next, uh, next on our list, we have Allison. So we will flip it over to her and we can get a, a different perspective um, from our friends to the north. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, uh, as mentioned, I'm Allison Lara. I'm an asset management engineer here with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Highways. In my job, I focus mainly on asset management standards and modeling, but that includes actually managing our data collection contract. So I've prepared a bit of a presentation to kind of show you how we go through all the steps of our data collection and then how we build our pavement preservation program using that data. So to start off, we, we automatically collect our pavement network um, using an automated road analyzer. Uh, typically we do that in the months of June and July, and we collect that in 50 meter increments. Uh, we collect 168 different fields, but they all kind of roll up into similar things. So uh, we're getting our pavement distresses, like our cracking, our rutting, our roughness, including bumps and dips, uh, our textural information, pickouts and raveling. We also collect a comprehensive set of right-of-way images. So it kind of looks like Google Earth or something when you're driving down the road. So you've got kind of real-time photos of the roads you're collecting. We collect about 50% of our network annually. We have 16,000 kilometers of pavement. So we collect usually between eight and 9,000 kilometers every year. Once we've collected all that data, then it's time to start rolling it up and getting into our pavement preservation. So we roll it up into three primary distresses. We have uh, the first one is uh, unique to Saskatchewan. We call it our surface condition indicator uh, or SCI. And that basically looks at your crack density and severity and some of your pickouts. 
And then of course we have rutting, uh, the maximum wheel path rut depth that you might find on a road, and then our international roughness, roughness index or IRI to measure the ride quality. And then when we're selecting projects, we look at all three of those, of course. We also look at traffic volumes, our maintenance costs, how the road's deteriorating, and then kind of what budget we have and how much treatments are costing. We have three different treatment programs that we spend money in. We have our light program, which is more of your, your pit seal coating or your fog sealing, and those are triggered by uh, FBI, so more based on cracking or, or pickouts. Medium program is more of your microsurfacing or your thin lift overlays, which are triggered by rutting. And then our heavy program, which is usually our resurfacing or rebuilding, which is primarily triggered by IRI, but it can be triggered by any of the three distresses. We do have trigger points for each of the distresses for the good fair poor ratios. So depending on what treatment you're looking at, they have different treatment trigger points. So to, to determine all of that, we actually use uh, modeling software. Right now we're using Dayton Total Infrastructure Management System, or DTIMS, which is a Canadian software company that's uh, actually used internationally to manage assets and budget. So basically what you do is you take your budget and say, this is how much I have to spend in, in whichever category I have set up. And then it spits out a condition result and a construction program for me. So to go into that in a little bit more depth, so you, you input all your information, your inventory, your traffic, all that great condition data that you just collected, how much treatments are costing, and your budget, of course. So you set up the model and what budget you want to look at. Then the modeling software takes that all that good data you just put in and it optimizes based on the pavement condition index. So that's something that we've built internally here at the Ministry of Highways. Uh, and it looks at kind of all your distresses, your cracking and your rutting primarily. Uh, we've built that based on our automated data collection. It's normally a visual assessment, but we've been trying to automate it just for this purpose. So it's something we've been working on lately. And then it takes that optimization period that you set up for your life cycle costing. And it looks at the deterioration curves for each of the different distresses. So we've, we've built some regression analysis for each of the distresses, IRI, Reading, and SCI. And then we've set up our different treatment trigger points. And so as the network deteriorates in the model, it will trigger treatments and then ultimately recommend a construction program. It will also show you how your network is deteriorating or improving as it may be based on that budget level and the treatments that are being triggered in the model. So you can kind of analyze it in each of the different distress categories. So if you're running your IRI or your SCIs in this case. And then, as I mentioned, it does spit out a very comprehensive construction program telling you what year you should probably select a treatment, uh, what treatment type and where it should, should go. You can adjust things as you go along, which of course you should do and exercise some engineering judgment. So before we finalize our program, we do go out and verify things in the field to make sure that the modeling software is working correctly and that that's actually a treatment we would want to place in that location. And then we finalize our light, medium, and heavy programs based on the available budget. We also have targets that we're trying to reach for each of our distresses on our different networks. So we kind of compare what conditions coming out uh, with our targets. And maybe we just don't have enough funding to meet our targets, or, or maybe something needs to be adjusted in the model so we can better meet our targets. Depends on, on what the situation may be. And once we've finalized our program, then we hand it over to our design group if something needs a design. And they also need condition data from us. So we do provide that to them. And that way they know um, how to design the road. It might be for something like rutting, uh, the road needs to be designed for. Maybe they need to add something to address packing like rubber or fiber to their design. So uh, we do provide that to them to aid in their process as well. As I mentioned, we do collect right-of-way imagery and some of the future uses that we're kind of looking into and, and some folks in our ministry are getting uh, interested in is leveraging those right-of-way images to collect other assets. 
So things like light standards or power poles or signs or line markings, because we, we are driving down the road and we see all these things. So you can build algorithms to flag some of these objects, but a lot of it right now is very manual to go through and assess. So it's maybe not the most practical thing yet, but I think as, as time goes on and the, the technology advances, it's a possible uh, another data collection point that we can get. So that's my presentation for now. I guess if there's any questions, we'll discuss them after the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate your time. Uh, Rob, once again, could you do the favor of introducing our next speaker from up north? Rob? I, I can let Chris introduce himself. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Sounds good. You guys are seeing my screen, right? Correct. We can, yeah, we're good to go. Go ahead, sir. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Kuffner. I am with Hennepin County. I in Minnesota. I'm the Asset Management Division Manager. I've been with the county about a year and a half and was asked to give sort of the local perspective of a county in Minnesota and how we're using our asset management and pavement data, how we make decisions with our pavement preservation program. I've been with the county about a year and a half, but prior to that, I had a 25 year career with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And the most relevant position there was I was a, uh, a district uh, pavement and materials engineer responsible for the pavement management program in that particular district. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Hennepin County Pavement Preservation Program and how we utilize the data. But here's just a quick snapshot of our location. We're in the southern third of Minnesota, and Minneapolis uh, is the largest city in Minnesota, and it is inside of Hennepin County. But we have a very diverse uh, roadway network, and so we have a very heavy urban area of Hennepin County, which then is surrounded by first and second tier suburbs. And then our westerly third of the county is actually very rural in nature uh, and actually a big uh, lake with many bays that uh, has restricted access and things like that. So we've got six lane urban sections and we have two lane two way roads with no shoulders with a lot of cities and the largest population in Minnesota. So definitely some challenges in managing a program. And there are 87 counties in Minnesota. So this presentation probably isn't representative of all of them as Hennepin County is the largest. And while any agency will say they don't have enough funding, the Hennepin County has a pretty good funding in the fact that we are able to afford and invest in our own uh, data collection equipment. And so we have actually our own profile equipment and then we have, uh, so we run our roads every year. And of course, this is based off the International Roughness Index. Uh, but then that's a calculation to what's called a pavement surface rating, which has a, a zero to five rating. And this coincides with how the Minnesota DOT uh, reports their smoothness as well. So we're somewhat apples to apples. So anything above three is gonna be good. Anything below two is gonna be poor. But then we also do a pavement condition index um, of which where we have staff that go out and still visually inspect all of those cracks and distresses and ultimately plug those, that information into a program that results in a pavement condition index ranking from zero to 100. And for several years, the Minnesota DOT has been providing pavement data via their pavement management bands to all of the counties in Minnesota. And they run that every other year. And, and I'll show you in a little bit, Hennepin County hasn't historically been using that, but I'm exploring ways to uh, reduce some of the redundancy and utilize similar information and, and maybe uh, improve safety for our staff that has been out there um, um, collecting that information. So, and other data, like the other two I've mentioned, I think the construction history is um, very, very important when you're considering your preservation program. You know, it's one thing if the, if you've uh, built a new road, how you're gonna treat that for your pavement preservation. But if it's an older road with multiple overlays, 
that uh, you may have a different strategy. So we have uh, all that history dating back uh, to the original construction and the subsequent overlays, surface treatments, and up to including reconstruction. So this is just a picture of, of some of the data that we get that combines those different data points that I was talking about. So it'll have our, and I'm hoping you're seeing my mouse move around, um, our road number, a, the from and the two, we have our commissioner districts, the length and the lane miles on that earlier graphic, I had some data on there. And, and we talk in terms of lane miles here at Hennepin County because of that diverse road network where you know you might have that six lane urban section trying to compare to a two lane rural, uh, much different if you just talk in center line miles. So we, we discuss things in terms of lane miles and then we'll know if it's uh, a bituminous pavement versus a concrete pavement or if it's uh, bituminous overlaid concrete. And we'll know the date of our last surfacing, mill and overlay, over on the far right. We have when it was uh, originally constructed. So this particular road was constructed in 1989 out of bituminous, and its last overlay was in 2014. And then there's our condition data, the ride quality, and the pavement condition index. We, have, we also have another one called the pavement quality index, which is essentially an averaging of those two pieces of data. And you can see the different values that we have, some construction of concrete and when it was overlaid, so older concrete um, overlaid, but all of this is important data, right? So here we have some in our our minds, this 2.41 is, is below a trigger point that you'll see in a little bit of when we should be considering an overlay. Um, 3.44 would still be considered in pretty good condition. 3.28 is nearing that threshold from good dropping to fair, and we'll utilize that information. I'll show you in just a sec. But here's a picture of the Minnesota DOT data that is supplied to us as well. And you see, see some very similar information. We're getting IRI, which calculates into their uh, ride quality, which happens to be RQI, and then their surface rating. So the measurement of the cracking, which is done um, automated. And then there's um, rut data provided as well. And one of the main problems for us right now is it's the same road, but the segments don't align. Um, they're not the same start and stop point. So our and we're not we're not tied to a linear referencing system quite yet. So we're trying to trying to uh, get into the 21st century on some of our data. And next next important factor is the the county does have performance measures and performance targets um, for several assets, but for pavement. We are focusing on the on the ride quality. So we have a target of 67% in good condition. And you can see as of last year, we had 62% poor. That pavement quality index, same target, but of course that's bringing cracking into the equation. You can see that we have more, we have less percentage in good. So it means we have more cracking um, than what is evident in the ride quality. So a lot of cracking, but they're still riding fairly smooth in some cases, many cases as a matter of fact. So how are we using all of this pavement data? Uh, well, obviously, we I mentioned before, nobody has all the money they want, so we're trying to optimize every dollar we have available to us. Um, we do not have any, we're, I shouldn't say we don't have, we're not currently using a pavement uh, management or modeling software. We have an older one that is available to us, but we haven't had the expertise nor the time to dedicate to that as of yet. Um, but of course, so we're using this data in all facets of our program, our capital program of reconstruction and pavement rehab, um, and then uh, all the way to our preservation program of overlays and preventive maintenance and chip seals and things like that. And we use the data slightly different. I'll be getting into that uh, age and number of overlays and how those overlays are performing. Sure factor into our reconstruction candidates. Um, you can see the next bullet there, data-driven decisions versus life cycle driven decisions. What I mean by that is our older roadways that you know were constructed 50 to 70 years ago and have multiple overlays. We're definitely tracking that condition indexes over time. And then though, as they approach our trigger values, we try to schedule them for overlays. And, and the farther they get down the path, more likely to be in our reconstruction categories. But what I'll talk about on new construction is more time-based treatments of, and, and uh, Tyler might've mentioned that as well in the first 
one. When is that opportune time to put that first chip seal on? Um, oh, I've got a graphic in that a little bit, but more time-based than condition-based so we don't miss any opportunities. Of course, we're striving to meet performance targets with all those decisions. And another great use of and having payment data available to us is just simply answering questions. Uh, we get a lot of questions from public, and I mentioned there's 40 different cities, varying sizes in Hennepin County. Many of them want to know when the next project will be on the county road that's going through their city. And we can make educated responses by having, you know, the, all that data available. Um, you know, it's a much different answer if, you know, the last resurfacing was three years ago and the ride quality is still good versus maybe uh, 12 years ago and approaching poor. And we'll be able to give them a very educated um, best estimate as to when the, that next project will be there. Then the public out obviously wants to have similar questions and get good answers as well. So some of the strategies here at Hennepin County, this is one that I feel very passionate about. I mentioned we have 2,200 lane miles and less than about 1% of those are in our reconstruction program each year. So not a whole lot. Um, so I've been stressing the importance to preserve those that uh, do happen to get reconstructed. So those are gonna be our first priority for preventive maintenance. I mentioned I had a long career at MnDOT and you know, working with uh, pavement management and our overlay programs there as well. And, and we tried a lot of, of different strategies to try to stop like ther reflective thermal cracking. Um, as far as I, I, I recall putting two lifts of stone matrix asphalt on a cracked uh, pavement and the and those cracks reflected through in three years. So I came came up with my mindset of the best treatment for a crack is to never let it happen in the first place. So let's try to keep that asphalt binder as flexible as possible and uh, in those first few years. So and of course um, we want to keep those good roads good. So how we use the data will actually filter the data and currently we're using spreadsheets for this. Um, all that data gets exported to the spreadsheets and so we'll filter on, hey, tell me what roads have been reconstructed or rehabbed in the last 10 years. And you see we did that recently and that was 258 lane miles out of our 2200. And we'll compare that to filtering the condition data, our ride quality data above 3.0, which is good. Uh, still in good condition, same with the pavement condition index and you can see some lane miles there. And then we'll compare that to that construction history and then is there anything in the proposed capital program? Um, and, I th and I think I'll re-emphasize the point here that both Tyler and Allison uh, stated as well, that we do agree that the data is a starting point. Uh, we, we use that uh, to generate our lists, and then we do field reviews and engineering judgment as well to make those good decisions. Um, just touch base on more of the life cycle decision-making process on that new bituminous pavement. I saw in Allison's presentation talking about rejuvenators. Uh, there have been a lot of research in uh, at Minnesota DOT and their partnerships, um, and so and we're we're excited about the opportunities with rejuvenators. So we've just started to dabble with them. But if I could tell you our ideal strategy for a new bituminous pavement right now, it would be a, put a rejuvenator on early in its life, um, and then a couple of well-timed chip seals and crack seal throughout uh, as those cracks appear. And then hopefully the first overlay can be uh, held off till year 25 or later. One thing I'll mention there um, on that, we have a lot of debate here um, just in the whole asset management realm of, uh, you know, we're expending significant funds on durable pavement markings and uh, monitoring the nighttime retro reflectivity. So while we might be able to argue someday that uh, putting a chip seal on in year one or year two is the ideal time, uh, but we're weighing that cost and whether or not we have to remove or impact the retro reflectivity of those markings. Um, so our, our current thought is let's put a rejuvenator on early in the life, uh, protect those markings, and then as the, the opportune time to put the first chip seal on might be at the same time when those pavement markings needs to be refreshed as well. So, um, and then to the, to the far other extreme, we have you know, 80 and 90 year old asphalt pavements that have been overlaid five times. Um, you know, we may not have much of a preservation mindset on those other than to crack seal them and, and then the surface treatment if it's appropriate. And then here's just uh, 
my last slide, a few strategies that we are employing here at Hennepin County. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, there was really two strategies, reconstruction and overlay. And as we've used pavement data and our open mindset, you can see we've been bringing a lot of tools into the into the toolbox and some of the different criteria that we use and trigger points for those treatments. So uh, with that, I will wrap up as well. So thank you, everybody. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, all three panelists. I'm going to ask that you all turn your cameras back on. Um, everyone, I, I, I apologize. I failed to mention at the beginning uh, of the webinar that you know, these, uh, this, this webinar series is intended for you, um, as, as I dropped in the chat earlier, that, you know, we could easily fill the time with just presentations, but I think we all learn better together if we can have a discussion, if we can have a conversation. So I, I strongly encourage that if you heard things uh, throughout the three presentations, if you scribble them down on a piece of paper, please drop them into the chat. Um, please, uh, we won't do the poll just yet, Patty. Um, uh, please put your questions into the chat and um, we would like to, uh, between myself and Phil, who was the other moderator, that was the other voice you heard, um, we'll keep an eye on that and, and we'll be asking the panelists um, and again, try to have as, as best of a dialogue as we can in this, in this virtual environment. Um, so I will, I will kind of kick it off. Uh, it looks like Tyler, there was a question for you uh, that states, what parameter does MDOT use for RSL? Um, so I guess I will, I will turn that one over to you, sir. Thanks, I, I, I did kind of gloss over um, RSL and how we use it. So um, going back, RSL is the parameter that we use. There is nothing that pulls into RSL. Our cells, we define it as the number of years until it's no longer cost effective to do preventative maintenance. So it's it's a ticking time down. It's an integer every year, how many years until that time, uh, until such time that a reconstruction or rehab is the only fix that we should acceptably do on this road. Um, so we have a data set. Uh, paid map that contains all the assigned RSL values on our entire network. Every segment has an RSL value assigned. Um, each year, it ticks down by by one. So the next year, it's a one lower value. Now, um, a third of the network every single year is reviewed by our region offices to make sure that the payment is corresponding to that to that timeline. It's very difficult to do in practice. Um, we have been working on revamping it uh, the last couple of years, redefining it, maybe pulling some more data in to help. Um, but that's currently how RSL works. Um, so for instance, when we do an overlay, the, um, the remaining service life is uh, assigned a higher value, typically nine years if we do a just single course overlay. Um, we add seven years or nine years, I can't remember which one it was, to that current RSL value to represent the fix. And then again, the next year it just starts ticking down again. So that is how we determine our good, fair, poor roads in the state. Um, and then we we also use our cell at the project level to make sure that you're, you know, if this if you said this road was, you know, only a five or a four, we're getting close to that time where preventive maintenance doesn't make sense. So we want to make sure that we're we're doing that. So I hope I covered that question, um, Rob. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, uh, encouraging folks who, who listen to, to please, uh, in, in the dialogue box on the right, you should find uh, an area to where you can put in questions. So please feel free to, to drop those, drop those questions in there. Um, the next question I have, I'd like to direct it, Allison, our partner to the north, where it's currently negative one degree Fahrenheit with a wind chill of negative 20. Uh, the first thing I did when I looked up uh, Regina is the question from Google is, is the coldest province in Canada? So my question to you, my friend, is because I don't have DTEMS, but this particular question asks, how do you marry what DTEMS recommends to your paper preservation plan? Uh, you mentioned light, medium, and heavy, but how, as we are in a paper preservation partnership, do you marry what DTEMS says you should do with your actual funding? And a caveat to that, 
uh, do you actually have a, a pavement preservation, perhaps a five-year plan up in the ministry to implement what it says? Allison? Yes, we do. Uh, so what you can do in DTIMS is you can set up different budget scenarios. So if you know your budget for the year or the next five years, because we do, we do have a, a rolling five-year capital plan. Um, we do like our light and mediums, we do on a two-year kind of rotating cycle. And then our, our heavies, we do on a five-year cycle for planning ahead. Um, but you can set up the budget. So if you know your budget or, and you can adjust it every year, you set up a scenario and say, okay, I want to spend X amount of money in light, X amount of money in medium, X amount of uh, money in heavy. And you can set up the model to do that. And it will recommend treatments up to that funding level. It may not even get to that funding level if, if the model doesn't think that it needs to spend that much money. You can also set it up in DTIMS to do unlimited. So if you say, hey, DTIMS, tell me the best projects ever. Here's an unlimited amount of money. Go for it. It can do that. You can tell it to spend no money. Or you can set up, um, instead of breaking it into the light, medium, and heavy uh, categories, you can say, here's my total amount of money. Tell me how to spend it in my light, medium, and heavy. So there's a variety of different ways and scenarios that you can set it up. Um, typically, we run a bunch of those scenarios and then see what sort of projects are being generated. And then once we go out and do our field reviews, you can actually go back into DTIM and you can adjust your strategies. So if it's, say, recommending a, a chip seal in, in 2023, but you don't think that's the most appropriate treatment, you can either cross it off the list or you can say, no, don't do that till 2025, and it'll adjust everything in DTIMS in your construction program for you. So it's kind of a handy tool for that. We haven't gotten super into that portion of it yet because we've only been utilizing the software for a couple years so we're still in a bit of a learning curve but it is a very powerful tool and and can do lots of those things i hope i answered answered all of that you did great thank you awesome uh we we do it manually here at modot just like apparently chris does uh in hennepin county we don't even have that system so you really helped me out on that one why don't i throw this one out it's a generic question i don't care for it too much but I got to ask it, uh, what about this recent spike in the Midwest, at least, regarding construction costs? Uh, does that affect the way that you're gathering your data? Uh, does that affect the way your computers are generating it? In this particular state, we've seen a 35% spike in costs of, of programs, thus allowing us to reflect and maybe add additional payment preservation partnership, uh, payment preservation treatments, forgive me. Uh, why don't I ask? Tyler, that first, do you see a spike like apparently everybody's seeing where you were going to overlay it and then subsequently the computer said X? How do you or do you even have that problem up north, Tyler? Sir? So, um, I guess when you say, does the computer say, uh, should we overlay? That's your program. Uh, Let's go with program. program. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think we've needed to focus more on preservation um, and it, it's turning into when you do a two course or major reconstruct, um, you know, the, the inflation, the inflated prices, of course, are it's a higher dollar value just because it's a, a larger fix anyways. So we've been moving more towards do we need to have such as substantial fixes when we have our costs are this high or they're, they're rising, we've moved to more of single course or additional preservation, kind of a stretching our preservation template out um, and doing more roads than we have in the past. So we're just as lean as we can be. Um, the strategies do take into account our funding um, and typical costs for projects. So yes, the, the investment strategies do reflect the current increases, but on a project selection level, we've been just trying to move our fixes around our, our, our fixed types uh, to kind of meet the dollars that we have. So. I hope that answered your question somewhat. Um, it's pretty complex, everything that's going on, and there's a lot of different job types. So do our best with the funding we have. Agreed. I stumbled over that question. Go ahead, Rob. Well, and, and I was going to say to add on to, to Tyler's and, and one of your main questions in there, Bill, is, is yeah, I mean, Michigan DOT is seeing an increase in, in prices for, for fixes, and that ultimately uh, impacts the number of lane miles that, that we've been able to touch. Um, 
you know, over the last couple of years and moving forward, I should say, right now too. Correct, and in MoDOT, which is where I work, uh, we are actually uh, adding zero new jobs. So all that data we collected with Fergo, which I think is what Allison uses, um, and we have a whole bunch of data that we collect, uh, up to 31 different metrics, and we were only using five. And now I'm going back saying, what else is it really telling me? In other words, like I, I want to ask out loud, we do a lot more visual now than we ever did just a year ago to say, hey, is this really a candidate for, I don't hear, insert random treatment, uh, because uh, we're, we're changing a lot of that stuff. So it's ironic as we talk about pavement gathering programs and data, data management that, that perhaps even in this state, we've taken a step backwards and say, I don't know if I trust the data uh, that I was gathering just a, just a week ago. So I think that was the root of the question. Um, Rob, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, you were saying? No, I, I just kind of added, just add a little bit to Tyler's uh, stance and, and answering the, the base question of, yeah, Michigan is seeing an increase, an increase in, in construction costs. Yeah, sorry, I missed that. Thanks, Rob. Um, it's definitely, it's on, it's on our radar. It, it's every year, it seems like it's not just tracking with inflation, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'd cool. Sim, I'd say it's similar in Saskatchewan as well. Like we're seeing an increase in cost. It hasn't impacted how we're collecting our data. We're still going through and collecting our data, but it is limiting our ability to add projects to the program because we're doing fewer and fewer kilometers every year. So our, our five-year program has grown into a seven or eight or nine-year program, and we haven't added anything new. So it, it just sort of as things change, your your program changes, and you just adjust to it. I feel amiss I didn't ask Chris the same question. Do you want to add anything, Chris? I, well, you're well, so rich. I there. Very, very similar response, I think, um, with uh, set and consistent budgets each year. So we have, a, you know, we know how much money we're going to have. And, uh, you know, this particular year, we also have lane mile goals for treatments of, say, combined of overlays and chip seals, right? So if it was, you know, oh, where's my camera? If it was this much of, overlay and this much of chip seal, the chip seal is cheaper, right? We might have to do more chip seal and less overlay to try to cover, you know, the same amount of lane miles. Be one, one other strategy to consider. Thank you. Uh, Rob, that's about all I've got to ask. Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to add before we issue our final thoughts and poll? Yeah. We, we, still, we still have a little bit of time. Um, again, hopefully some folks have you heard anything, please feel free to, to throw it in there. Uh, Chris, I want to ask you something I saw in your presentation. Uh, I think you had shown a strategy, a proposed ideal strategy of a new HMA reconstruction and kind of a timeline um, of, of different treatments. Now, is this something that you have been able to do successfully? Uh, at Eppin County or in Minnesota DOT, or is this still something that you're looking to achieve? Yeah, I would say a little bit of both. It's still it's the like the long range objective, especially on those new new construction roads. I even had that opinion at MnDOT. You know, is you do a heck of a lot more overlays and and what we call them band aid overlays, and you know those aren't your best preservation and preventive maintenance opportunities. It's let's, you know, when we do make the big capital expenditure, let's make those our first priority and uh, be sure we preserve those. Going forward. So yeah, it's a little bit, we've just started to implement it. Yep. Okay. Allison, do you guys do anything similar um, in Saskatchewan? Do you guys try to plan out treatments or is it kind of, you know, relying a little bit more on the data to, to make a call when you're, when you're doing something? It's a little bit of both. We, we utilize the data, but we also know that certain treatments work most effectively in a certain time window. Um, and then we try to say, okay, this treatment first, then this treatment next, and this treatment next. But it is somewhat dependent on what sort of distresses you're seeing. Like maybe a road isn't cracking very much, but it's sure rutting. So Maybe you skip the chip seal and, and go right to a um, micro rut fill or something like that. But 
I'd, I'd say typically there's there's a pattern. Yeah, I not meaning to to speak for Tyler, but I know um, you know in, in Michigan we we kind of kick that idea around you know with the life cycle. Do we, um, especially with our new reconstructs, should we be looking at a plan of you know giving a range um, on when particular preservation treatments should, we, we should really be considering to try to extend the life of that pavement as much as possible, kind of like what you're saying, Chris, that, with that flexible pavement, if we can get the right type of treatments on it and keep it flexible to prevent those cracks. Um, Minnesota, Michigan, we're, we're dealing with the same type of weather conditions. Those freeze-thaw cycles are, are worst enemy. So um, we're, and we, we have a, um, we, we take our pavement management engineers from across the state and we kind of have a group that we call the pavement working group and we meet at least monthly if not uh every other week and kind of chew on these different ideas on how to uh you know what what's the best way to be managing our, our entire network from a statewide level to a uh, to a smaller level you know from a, a regional level across the state um Another question that I'm seeing is uh, chip seals. When, um, I guess I'll, I'll throw this one out to, to everyone. Uh, what, what do we think on a newer construction um, HMA pavement? What, what, do we, what do we think the, a good timeline is to apply our first chip seal? I guess I could go first. This is something I've thought about and thought about and thought about. And, um, we have local counties uh, in the area that chip seal the next year after an overlay, and they think they see the value out of that. Um, I'm on. I'm a little more conservative than that. I think we need to develop a little, yeah, somewhere and allow the, the HMA to be out there for two, three, four years, um, and then apply the chip seal. And I feel like the life extension is longer in that case. Um, but it is good, especially like Rob mentioned in our freeze thaw cycles, uh, to have a sealed surface and a wearing course. Uh, I mean, these pavements just have such a hard life in Michigan. So I would like to do our chip seals earlier, but I think from a funding standpoint, that five year old pavement to seven year old pavement is an okay candidate depending on the condition. So I think I would echo what Tyler said. I, I think. My stance would be there's no, it's never too early to chip seal it, but the is the cost effectiveness really there and is five to seven acceptable? I would I would think it is. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well. I think there's other treatments available that are cheaper that could be utilized. Like we had been talking about rejuvenator fog sealing. I would maybe consider doing that first and then getting into a, a chip seal kind of in that seven-ish year range. But again, subject to conditions. I don't see a lot of value in putting it on in the next year. I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily an effective use of your funding. That's my personal opinion. Um, so, a lot of a lot of conversation with HMA pavements. Um, I know Michigan, we got our fair share of concrete or rigid. Um, Allison or, or Chris, do you guys have rigid pavements? And if so, what are some of the uh, preservation techniques and, and how do you utilize the data to um, plan those treatments? In Saskatchewan, we don't. We actually use flexible pavements pretty much exclusively. I know we've thrown around the idea of rigid pavements, but uh, we don't have any tools in our toolbox right now for that. So I'd actually be interested in hearing some more about that if anybody else has some good input. That's what we have pretty limited amount of concrete pavement in Hennepin County. Um, of the 2,200 lane miles that we have, uh, like 100 miles are uh, exposed concrete. We have plenty of overlaid concrete. So, like back in the 1950s and 60s, 
it was pretty popular to pave concrete pavement on the on the county system, but those have been overlaid with asphalt, um, a lot of them numerous times. Um, but I had plenty of experience back in my Minnesota DOT days as well with, with concrete pavement. And, um, you know, the, the quality of the concrete has changed over time. It's really improved in the last 20 plus years. Um, re, uh, resealing joints, doing minor repairs in the first 15 to 20 years is certainly advisable. And uh, since some of the major full depth joint repairs later on in its life is obviously advised as well. And one thing, so like as we have a hundred miles and the majority of it is pretty old and our ride quality data, IRI is very high on those. They've been rehabbed. They're not necessarily in bad condition, just they ride very rough because they've never been diamond ground. So that is what I'm proposing for some of our future concrete uh, maintenance is that whatever we whatever work we do on them, even if it's just resealing the joints and doing some minor repairs, is that we include that diamond grinding on it to improve that ride quality as well. Yeah, I'll just say that at, at MDOT, outside of grinding, grooving, resealing, like Chris mentioned, um, I think as far as preservation goes, composite pavements with concrete under under the HMA um, are sometimes a, a different animal than pulled up flex and a lot of times are. Uh, you need to get them, get after them early in the preservation cycle if you're ever gonna hope to preserve those, um, the thermal movement, all that cracking. It, it, you know, you need to handle it with a seal and sometimes it's not even, there's not even enough value there to seal some of those routes, they, the, the reflector cracking so bad. So I struggle with that a lot. We have many thousands of composite lane miles at MDOT and um, it, it's a challenge from a preservation perspective. And also like Chris mentioned, doing the patching on concrete, resealing on concrete. Concrete is a tough tough nut to crack for preservation as well, um, unless you want to spend man, many millions of dollars doing patching. A lot of times it's better just to do, you know, fold up reconstruction. Um, but we do preserve concretes. We do quite a few reseal jobs, um, but yeah, thanks. Our, uh, our next question, if I could ask it, Rob, Go we got a few it. minutes. Okay. Next question, Chris. Uh, looks like you're on again, buddy. What are the benefits you're seeing from rejuvenators? When do you apply them? And any distresses or new pavements? Have you done a side by side comparison? And before you answer, I'd like you to reference if you know anything about that NWRA study that you probably know about up there. Chris, let's talk about rejuvenators quickly. Yeah, so we put our first rejuvenator on a couple of years back um, as very, a very short segment, of maybe at 500 feet, 1,000 feet, something like that. One on a one on a mainline section, and then one on a shoulder, just as a very early experiment to, to do that side by side comparison. Uh, it's only a couple of years old, um, but we I wouldn't be able to say there's any difference in the pavement management data yet. Uh, but visually, it looks it looks good, uh, good enough for us to go ahead and, and try another uh, couple miles last year. And then we're talking about maybe a bigger program, uh, six, seven, eight lane miles this year. So um, too, too early for me to give my opinion on its effectiveness, but no major problems either, which is just as important, right? There's concerns about payment marking. There's concerns about um, loss of friction so we haven't witnessed that um on, on the couple of trials we did and i'm certainly aware of the nra uh experimentation very very interested in hearing the results but i have not been closely tied in with it good i'll field that one uh allison who asked the question go ahead and look up national road research alliance it's in and it's on mindot's uh, page there's a five-year study we're currently about year three uh, in, in figuring out what rejuvenators do, how they do it, why they do it. Uh, it's pretty extensive, and my MoDOT uh, definitely was excited about this particular program. Uh, I sit on the tap on it. So the answer, Chris, is we don't know yet, but we're putting it up in a town called St. Michael's, which is somewhere in America, <laughs> north of me. Uh, and and we're, it's actually going to be exciting. So 
if, if I can get your email, Allison, I might actually email you a direct link, but go ahead and look at NRRA's website regarding rejuvenators. I think it's going to get a, a real good in partnership with NCAT, uh, some data out there on is this stuff actually effective uh, in the program. Rob? Let's see here. Uh, next question. Um, has anyone utilized the PMS data for developing inputs for LCCA? Uh, such as typical timing of treatment and types of treatments. I, I think that one's, that one's for the entire field, if anybody wants to weigh in on that one. All right, we'll go with I don't know, and I'll have to get back to that particular uh, partner, not now. Yes, phone. Um, well, let's get another one then. Uh, Chris, once again, you seem to be quite often popular. Uh, I've heard MnDOT, Minnesota, forgive me, is looking to put in joints in the asphalt composite pavement. Have you done that in your previous career or current career? So Sir? Working joints into a new composite pavement? We have not done that, no. So that I'm trying to is that to try to probably control the cracking over the over the concrete joint below it. Um, I I could see some potential value in that. I'm a, I'm a little skeptical though, as I do think the the, the power of the like I think Tyler was getting at that movement that's happening in that concrete um, expansion contraction. I, th I think that's going to win. Yeah, I think right. what I've read from the research done on that, I believe it was Minnesota years ago, did a few of those jobs. Um, it, it's difficult to saw cut right at the crack, and a lot of times the cracks propagate outside the saw cut anyways. So just let them crack and reseal them is my opinion on that. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I think Michigan, we experimented uh, a little bit with that. And as Tyler stated, and what you're alluding to, Chris, then trying to line up the saw cut exactly on top of that existing joint, uh, I think ended up being a little more of a challenge than what everybody anticipated. Well, when I ask for questions, good Lord, people, well done. There's a boatload of them. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to slowly go through it. I'm going to jump around on you. Uh, ask, I'll ask it quite bluntly. Go back to my friends up way up north. Dabar retrofits. We haven't talked about composite, uh, excuse me, rigid concrete. With reference to Dabar retrofits, I understand many of DOTs have used them to be cost effective. Does you gather that somehow in your pavement gathering data as an option? This is Saskatchewan. It's your turn. We don't use rigid pavement, so. So no. No. Um, That's easy. I, I, I don't know if it's an option that we're gonna kind of get into, but right now the answer is no, we, we don't use that at all. Up north, you guys have concrete surely, right? We use it extensively. I could talk, but I'm not a panelist. Chris, first, then Tyler. So our, our data, doesn't report like faulting. Ours does, yeah. Okay. Um, but our, our, rough, our roughness would certainly be Im impacted. And so on a concrete pavement, if it was super rough, that would be a trigger for us to go out and look at it. Why, why is it so rough? And, uh, and then if faulting was the primary cause for that roughness, then we would consider dollar bar retrofit followed by diamond grinding. Mr. Hunt, anything? We yeah, we've done it in the past, Sim similar to what Chris said, is uh, wait for the faulting data to show up and d determine if retrofitting, you know, dial bars at the slab makes sense um, to kind of control that. I think we've had mixed results. Maybe Rob knows more than I. Um, with that in the past, they're very expensive projects, um, and we don't know if the cost is worth it, basically, especially in preservation. So. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, <clears throat> there was an era, I want to say maybe uh, mid to late 90s, that we did a fair amount of them. And, and we've seen good performance with them when it's done uh, 
properly. It's just the, the cost of them started to become not cost efficient to where our contractors started to, uh, you know, throw out there, you know, at this cost or less, we'll just replace the joint itself. So, and that's why we ended up backing away from the Delbar retrofit. Um, so one, one other fun little uh, tidbit on that fix. So if you're in a state or a provident, Providence that um, you're seeing a push, and, and you know this will be for you too, Phil and, and uh, MoDOT. And autonomous vehicles. We we actually got contacted by General Motors that when their their lane detection system, when they come up to the Dalbar retrofit fix in the pavement, if, for those who aren't familiar with it, that there's little rectangles to where they cut saw cut out, put the Dalbar in, and then patch over top of them. Um, the autonomous vehicles, their computers see that and it goes from a three lane or four lane section to where all of a sudden it picks up all those additional rectangles and it tricks the computer thinking that it's in a 12 lane section um, to where we actually had General Motors reach out to us and say, hey, are you guys still doing this fix? Is there any way you could stop doing this fix? And we politely said, uh, thank you for your input, but if it works for us, we're still going to be performing the fix. But. Cool. I didn't know that. But yeah. to answer Mr. Martin, and I'm trying to give you MoDOT's answer, even though I'm not technically here, we use extensively use Dalbar retrofits uh, to bore you to tears. And I'm sorry to use imperial measurements, but we used to use 33 and a third for our joint spacings, cracks at about 17. We put in three sets of Dow bars, five bars, one, two, three, one, two, three in the wheel pass, that's extremely effective. Uh, so that's that's the answer. And as you've heard me speak before, we're, we're moving toward a little more hot polymer concrete patching material concept. Uh, this is this fiber creek concrete, and that is what's replacing it. The challenge is the DVRs are working great. It's just the mortar around them that's popping out. So to answer your question, Mr. Martin, ineffectively perhaps, it's extremely worthwhile for MoDOT. We've been doing it at least since 1983. And the ones that I'm repairing as pavement engineer have been down at least 15 years. So I would go ahead and say it's probably cost effective. To answer it on a computer base, yes, we now, one thing I told you, we're going back and looking at things. Uh, we have 31 me metrics and I'm not looking at them. Yeah, faulting is a big one, Chris. I haven't looked at faulting. We looked at IRI because it was easy. Now we can actually go back in every frame, 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 frame and say, well, son of a buck, that's really cost, you know, human effective. Yeah, there's an answer. There's an answer. There's an answer. We'll grind them down, put DBRs and call it good and keep our rigid payments rigid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. I apologize for not getting that earlier. Uh, you have many a question. I was gonna, I was gonna jump one um, for one for Allison. Um, sorry, yeah. Uh, could you go into more depth on the pavement analysis software that that is used? How long have you been using it? How how was it to develop? How is it? Uh, to, what is the calibration process? Uh, sure. Um, I, we've been using it for a couple of years, uh, but there was some setup time involved before that. It probably took us two years to get it set up. Um, and it is sort of a, a learning curve too. Like I think it's a, a dynamic process. Once you've got it set up, I don't think it's the, it's set up, it's good. No, um, you, you kind of adjust things as you're going through because you're learning what the model's doing as, as you watch it run um it it is time consuming to set up because there's a lot of variables a lot of treatments it depends how many treatments you have i suppose um a lot of data to get in there depending on how big your road network is so it, it is a, a difficult thing um but i think overall it's worth it because particularly if you have a larger network and and you can add other assets too it's not just exclusive to payment if you want to model bridges you can model bridges so you can use that to um, kind of get it to tell you where to spend your money maybe it's more effective to spend it on bridges maybe it's more expect effective to spend it on pavements you can get it to tell you that so it's a really powerful tool but it's only as good as the data that you put into it so if you have bad data or your setup's not quite right, you're not going to get the result you're expecting. So it's really useful as I'm learning to know the back end of it, know how it's working, know what you should be getting. And then if you're not getting what you're expecting, 
know how to go back and fix that. So not only am I a, a civil engineer, now I'm, I'm kind of becoming a, a programmer and computer scientist learning lots about that. And th their support system's really good too. So if, if you are having issues, um, they, they're certainly very helpful in, in giving you answers to why some things might not be working the way you expect. Hope that answered the question. It's kind of a, it is a learning curve. Um, yeah, no, I, I, was, I, I was just gonna agree with you that depending upon where you're at, uh, career-wise and in the projects that you're involved with, Little did I know how much computer programming or input <laughs> you would start to have. Um, you know, it's, sometimes it's easier to just stick with the uh, with the pavement and walking the grade personally, but it comes with the territory, I guess. Yeah. Oh, you got another one out there? I am, but I'm talking to Allison. You're you're up next. Grab another one. I'm okay. answering her. Gotcha. Um, let's see here, we've got one. What is your timeline for putting a chip seal on a reconstruct? We already covered that one. Let's see here. Uh, Chris, I think this one's directed to you. So the older or multiple layer pavements only get a crack seal. What is, what is the schedule for that? How long do your overlays last? Yeah, so pretty variable performance but it as i said in my intro i've been here about a year and a half so still learning the system what we've learned fairly early on was a lot of the roads that are older pre pre-1990 were built right on the existing soils right so if it was clay that was just thick asphalt paved on the clay um, so those overlays are not lasting very long right so if we're on our fifth overlay we might expect you know 10 years out of that overlay but if it's had a good sand subgrade with some aggregate base and it's on its third overlay that that one may last uh, 15 to 20 years with and then that one i would consider different i may say let's crack seal and chip seal or consider a surface treatment on those that are expected to perform better i just reflective and thermal cracking is such a predominant distress here and it kind of drives our overlay programs that uh that in my mind the chip you know not it's where that big rip and crack is is the problem right but and then in between the cracks everything's great so the, the chips it would preserve that but you still have that big rip and crack and the potholes forming at that reflective um, thermal crack so that's why I, I would say probably shy away from surface treatments on those older segments but I've got one from Scott uh, Allison. He asks, could you go into a little more depth on DTEMS? How long have you been using it? What's your comfort level? And is it calibrated? Allison? I kind of did that one, Bill, all right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, check it off, man. <laughs> Put a checkbox on it, man. Back to you, Mr. Green. Oh, you're killing me now. Um, I know. That's because I'm too busy answering these people. Yes. Uh, questions. All right. So That's the question on. is, do any of your agencies have a PM data quality assurance process in place? If yes, could you explain the QA process that you use? Thanks. Um, real quick answer. Um, keen eyes. <laughs> Reviewing and looking for anomalies, yes. Um, in Saskatchewan, yes, we do. We we do review all the data that's, they send it to us in, in batches and we review it to make sure it's falling within uh, the bands that we pulled them. And if there's an outlier for some reason, we do go through it with, with our consultant to say, hey, why is this anomaly here? And maybe it's a data collection issue. Maybe it's an, another issue that, uh, was just a bit of an anomaly in the pavement maybe so we're pretty good about going through it on our own and then going through it with our consultant so we we've got some spreadsheets built to to analyze and different bounds that each distress needs to fall within um, they also do 
a lot of calibration on their own equipment when they're doing it. So they, they go back to one of our test sites and, and calibrate and make sure that we're getting similar results all the time. And we just compare those results to see if they are kind of all coming back similar. Yeah, we have a unit in our planning division uh, that ha that handles all the data, um, uh, the condition data, distress data, um, and they do verifications and they do all that. But again, like Chris said, we we're verifying at the job level to make sure the data makes sense. There's some there's some data metrics that are better than others, in my opinion. IRI, I, I tend to trust quite a bit in our cracking percentage and some others, maybe a bit less, uh, just due to the nature of how it's collected. But for the most part, yes, all our data is QA'd. Doing. Thanks. Uh, Chris, looks like we got another one for you. Uh, how did you decide that you will only do 1% reconstruct or only or only 25? Yeah, so that's that peer funding based. So we have targets to do even more than that, and we're, we've made presentations and would like to continue to make presentations to our county board to show you know that the need is higher. That's that's funding based. Um, from say from 2000 to 2010, I was just searching on this by decade, we averaged uh, over 35 lane miles of reconstruction, and just probably as we talked before, you know costs are going up of reconstruction projects, the water treatment facilities is more, you know, for underground storage and, and infiltration and all that. So everything co costing more, so we're doing less lane miles with a very stag stagnant budget. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to take that, Phil, as my key to, to ask another one out there. Um, I'm still how are you to these people. Sorry. You're, you're good. No, it's, I, I appreciate you kind of manning that side of it too. Uh, how are you incorporating structural condition of pavement in terms of choosing the right rehab? I, I think it's directed at Chris, but I think it can apply to, to the other two panelists as well. Well, I'll, I'll start with, with that situation I described with the thick asphalt pavement on the weak subgrades, they are not necessarily all meeting what a 10 ton design. Our, our goal with any rehab project would be to meet the current design standards. In the cases where we can't, then it would, uh, you know, we have only a lot of times that requires to raise the profile or get deeper into the subgrade and strengthen the subgrade rate. Right? So hopefully in 95% of the cases will be meeting the current design standards, but in those cases where it won't, we'll, you know, I'm I'm still willing to do like a cold in place recycling with a three inch overlay on top of it um, to hopefully extend that road longer than just the two inch mill and overlay would have, even if it won't officially meet, you know, those the 10 ton design standard. Hopefully that answered. Yeah. Yeah, when, Saskatchewan, don't when we don't consider structure directly in any of our modeling, but we do consider wearing cords. So we might recommend a different treatment depending on what's there. Um, we do have some roads that don't have asphalt concrete on top at all. They, they have uh, just a, a chip seal over top of base so some of the treatments we might recommend might be a little bit different on those roads um, but generally speaking the structure doesn't come into it until the design phase if you're getting into that rehab or, or reconstruct phase. All right. Mr. Hunt do you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah I guess there's there's so many factors but uh, typically what triggers a rehab for us would be um, the RSL value I talked about before, once the RSL starts ticking down near zero, um, thin treatments, um, even thin overlays just don't make a lot of sense. If we're doing 
is let's say a, a full depth joint repairs on a composite pavement every 20 feet it's not worth it to do a single course in that scenario and do all that patching so let's go down fix it and put two courses back and get some longevity and then there's also you know are we in a high volume route where we have lots of maintenance traffic costs uh, do we want to be coming back here in eight to ten years to another single course um, so there's other considerations like that too but in general it's is the road highly distressed then it falls out of preventive maintenance for us all right well taking a quick look at the time uh we've got 12 23 eastern we've got seven minutes left in our program i, I think we may have hit all the questions but one of the things that i want to do is um myself phil uh, and, and the panelists i'll uh, see if we can capture these questions and kind of quickly go back through them and if there's nothing that uh if there's one that we did not address we, we will try to get the answer back out to you um i i hope everyone here i first i guess i'd like to, to thank our, our our panelists you guys did a fantastic job um second i want to thank all the attendees um, it, it, I apologize. It's I fumbled the football on this one on where the questions were coming in at, um, and then made uh, made life hard on Phil on bouncing around asking questions. So trying to keep them straight. Uh, thank you for for your patience and, and rolling with us. But I, I hope everyone found that this is very valuable. Um, again, we the, the intention of these of this webinar series is for you uh, to allow you to ask questions um, that you may have. Um, because I, I think one of the things that, that comes out with these is we may be sitting in different chairs, different states, um, but we're all wrestling with the same stuff. Um, so hearing how others are approaching it, um, you know, I, I learned personally from that way, scribble down some notes on what to go look at. Um, so, so thank you. Um, Bill, did you have any closing remarks before? we do the closing poll. No, I appreciate it. Opening that can of worms on rejuvenators. There are three of you that I've been answering. I'll get back to you. I'll grab your emails. Uh, the questions you asked are awesome. Uh, however, I don't know all the answers and, and it would take longer than the time. So rest assured, I've got all three of them and I will be contacting you uh, from a philip.rufus at mo.mo. Uh, back to you, Rob. Awesome. The answer, Mo. All right. <laughs> so, um again hopefully you guys found this valuable um i am all about providing information that you all want to hear and learn from um so this closing poll that that's going to pop up on your screen is going to be a question on future topics uh take a look at, at the poll if any of those kind of interest you uh please select those otherwise i think you can drop them in the chat for future uh, topics. And uh, just so everybody knows how this works, we uh, here at Midwest uh, Partnership, we have uh, what we call a task force. There's, one, two, three, there's five of us or so that, you know, look at, look at your guys' suggestions and then reach across the Midwest looking for fantastic panelists like we have today that may have some experience in in the subject that, that you're asking about um, so that then we can we can create these open forums to continue to ask questions and learn from one another um, so please take the time to do the poll um, and throw in the chat any additional topics that you that you would like to see us talk about And then Patty, while um, people are answering the poll and maybe typing things, hopefully typing things in the chat, um, we were were we able to secure continuing education credits for this? Yes, everybody will receive CEUs um, that attended. Uh, it takes MSU a while 
um, but you'll get them an email from MS2 in approximately two months. You'll also get a certificate initially right at the get-go sometime in the next 24 hours for being on the call. Some people can use that. Some people need the more official. So the, the official will also be coming. Perfect. So yeah, double okay. benefit, right? Not only do you get to learn uh, a little bit more about specific uh, preservation treatments and happenings, but for those of us that are licensed, we also can gain some credits to, to keep our licensure. Okay, we've got five different topics. Thanks guys for putting that in the questions. I will forward those to you, Mr. Green. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, polymers, look at that. People like polymers. And really? performance measures. <laughs> um, and the performance measures, yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting topic in and itself. I guess I'd have to go back and look. Did we cover performance measures at our Missouri meeting last fall, Mr. Rufus? Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, maybe we can talk. About... Sorry, go ahead, sir. No, I was going to say maybe we can we can kind of reconvene for the folks that weren't able to attend. I know uh, Mr. David Petchkin is, I think, our our lead on that for sure. But correct and. Again, I have to just give you kudos, people. I, I've never seen this many comments or questions. Well done. I have now seven, now nine different ideas, uh, Rob, that you can see in the questions that we can talk about. If you want to talk about polymers and pavement, uh, MoDOT has extensive experience in doing that, so we could definitely explore that, as well as many other ideas you have in the chat. Rob? Yes. No, I... I, I do greatly appreciate it. I appreciate everybody's participation. Thank you again to the panelists. Um, when you see the next one coming out uh, next quarter, um, please share it with, uh, with your colleagues and, and other peers in the, in the pavement preservation world. We're, we're looking to continue to get out and spread the good word. That is that is all I have today as we are now at uh, 12.29 Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and have a safe day. Yes. Patty, can you take us back private? To have a debrief. Yeah, just a minute. Sorry, ma'am. It'll be taped if we do that, just so you know, it'd be on the end of the recording. It'll be fine. I'll just admit what I did right, what we did wrong, and we can do better next time. That's kind of what I used to do at the old days. We may, I mean, if Rob wants to keep doing that, that'd be fine. Okay. Uh, I think it went well after my microphone bloody worked. So I that all that, you know, less than perfect fluidity. I'll take the it. I should my microphone worked great, Patty. I don't know what happened. Happens. You know, it happens. But not, no, it doesn't. <laughs> not my world. It has to be smooth. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll since they're still listening, that's fine. Yeah, I I'm can't believe. Totally, it. Um, Look at all these questions, dude. Holy yeah. cow! I have not. I had to actually drop out the questions box and put it on my second screen to try and scroll through those. Uh, I count at least. 18, 19 questions. Well done. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Guys. So we're good. Okay. Are we back private? Well, we're still being recorded. I kicked everybody else off. So it's that's just fine. Like, it's still on. Um, right. Yeah. If the other guys want to hang, that's cool. Uh, what do you all, since we could have a quick debrief, what did you like? What did you not like? What can we do better, Rob? Yeah. Can we, can we take the poll down so I can see y'all? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I can tell me I can do that because I'm right. an organizer. My bad, but Patty oh, can do it. No, I, uh, so that, that was that was a shame on me on um, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where the questions were. No, that that's... Cool. well, again, sorry, Allison. This is 
this stuff's talking. Um, that's on me, pal, because I've ran this the entire time fluidly, and I knew they were there, but I couldn't talk to you. So yeah. that was on me. And what we'll do if we do it, good idea, let's explore this. What we'll do if we do it, whoever's running the show, whether it be you or the next president, is pop that questions bar out, and as you answer it, as you can see it now, click yeah. on who answers it, because I sent two of them to, to our panelists, and they answered them in the chat, which kind of expediated some of it and why I wasn't paying attention. I asked the same question twice. Yeah, that's on me. But I was I was doing that the whole time. So it actually works better when you have an MC, which was you, and then maybe a person in the background who's actually answering questions. Uh, because crap, they came in so hot and heavy. The last one I gave Allison, uh, how much is it? Well, I don't think that's a great question to ask. Why don't I just go ahead and send that to Alice and let her answer that person, how much does it cost? But equally so, this other lady, good Lord. She's sure. intense. She asked two or three of them. Like, I finally I wrote her back. I'm like, look, I'll just email you directly. This is a conversation that's wonderful, but good night. It's are, like, are, bam, are, bam. Are you referring to Margaret? And Allison Hamlin, not this Allison, the other one. Uh, Cliff Turgeon had three. Timothy Martin threw up six of them. And like you said, you didn't know where to look. So if we debrief next time, whoever runs it, whether it be me, because I bungled it. Or someone else. Let's make sure we we go through the the pretend one we did, and then yeah. it sounds simple, but they're not in the chat. They're actually in the asker. Yeah. But you didn't know that. I yeah well, no I'm not, I didn't know that. So. Again, I'll take the hit. That was on me. But we can. I want it to be fluid, as you remember from when I used to run things with yeah. you. I love fluidity because then people are like, holy crap, these guys have their active gear. I think we did a minus. A-. It was definitely good, but it could have been even better uh, because what I was doing on the side was also asking additional how they parted in. I like write a little diagram. You know, do these connect? Do these not connect? And there, and I couldn't keep up. There were too many of them. So uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, your time on this, both of you, and I don't see anybody else. I think it's just us. Um, yeah, because we're asking these people questions, too, and I'm guessing that our panelists were not ready for some of those questions. So in the future, do we text you or do we say, hey, man, I've got this one coming up. That may be an also another opportunity for them to prep that answer so that they don't. It goes a little whatever, because I, I ask questions. You're like, oh, crap, I don't know the answer to that. And it yeah, would be better. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, like I was sort of expecting to be able to see stuff in the chat, but all I could see was was stuff that we were chatting about. I know. Well, we you, the person, uh, the organizers have the ability to see all the questions, and they can assign them to panelists, and then the panelists can see them. But otherwise, the panelists cannot. Now, one thing we could do next time is just make everybody an organizer, all the panelists, you know? Agreed. Um, or we could go ahead. think that would be better, or, you know, I don't know. I think we'll do it in the kitchen or my way and have one person then see it. Well, respectfully, ma'am, yeah, it's hard to no. get the power. Yeah. Um, one person will be, you know, maybe the, the smiling face. And then the other person maybe will be the person that assigns questions like I would do it. And since I was late and I'm mad at myself, I didn't have that extra 10, five, 10 minutes to go ahead and set that up on my board where I would throw questions while uh, maybe one of the other two panels were answering it. Let's oh, let's and, think about that. Well, and, and I was gonna I was gonna say Phil, as much as you're you're taking the blame for it, we're also saying in the same breath, we have never had questions quite like this. So I mean, I I, I chalked that up as a success that it was a a very good topic that people clearly everywhere are struggling with and, and trying to trying to learn trying to see what's going on. So I'll take that. Will you be back with us, Ms. Laura, or is this your one-time performance? Uh, I guess the objective depends. Okay. I think I think the intention eventually would be for me to kind of get more involved in the Midwest Pavement Partnership after Nicole kind of gets back, but we'll see how it goes. That's what I want. <laughs> I, think I'm, I always I look. Think I'm scheduled for to come to the conference too. So that's just recruiting good. more and more people, ma'am. Right. <laughs> And you're somebody I've never met before. So, yeah, that's what I always did that in the old days, too. Let's yeah. see if we continually kind of grow this as we get more and more people we don't know. Um, you got to watch out for him, Allison. He's the one who, who horn swaggled me, and next thing I know, I'm chair. So, I don't know. That's how things work. That's how things work. And, and horn swaggle is a good word. I mean, 
who else would expect South Dakota to run the show in two years? Did you see that coming? Nope. We have to make that a reality. I mean, it's South Dakota. I mean, seriously, what's there? <laughs> got nothing. Uh, but yeah, I got that other guy. Got a great first name on him. Uh, you know, and kind of really said, this is an opportunity for you guys to really showcase it. I don't care where it is. And I don't really know because that's your job. But yeah, what an opportunity to go a little bit west. We've been east quite a bit. Maybe an opportunity maybe for you kids to, I don't know, maybe even drive there instead of constantly having to take two or three connecting flights. Not you plural or you singular, you plural. Canadians. Um, yeah. Hey, man. All you got to do is go across North Dakota and it's like you're there. Okay. I've driven to the Black Hills before. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah. drive, but it's doable. Yeah. Cool. All right. Anything else that we did well or not well? Otherwise, I appreciate you all listening to me. Uh, and, and I'm excited because we're getting some kids here that, that are asking questions. And, and maybe we're doing a good service. And that, that was kind of the mission when you started this whole idea of doing uh, webinars under your and, and Nicole's glorious leadership. Yeah. Other than that, I got nothing. I'm going to go home. I, okay. <laughs> So just real quick, Patty, do we have all these questions captured? Yeah, they're all automatically saved. I can send them out yeah. to you. Yeah. And then, yeah. Patty, sorry. Yep. If you'll give me a listing of these people's emails, I'm going to talk to you. I'm, I'm being rude, I know. I got to answer. Yeah, I'll send here. the attendee list and the questions. Thank you, ma'am, because that'll yep. at least give me a chance. And, and again, my mission to you, Rob, is if we engage and we make them feel ownership and, and comfort, then they're, you're no longer on an island. So maybe some of these people, I don't even know them, but maybe some of these people are like, oh God, I don't know what who I could ask. And that's kind of what we talked about even two years ago uh, yeah. before COVID ruined us uh, in, our, in, our, in our network. Uh, I'm excited, I'm excited. Every time I talk to you, I get excited and realize this isn't my job anymore. <laughs> I have to so leave. Just, just a heads up. Um, Margaret, if you ever, if she gets you on the phone, she's got a lot of passion and she is just you know her. Yeah, yeah. So she's, is she she's a, is she a Michiganian? Yes, her and yeah. Hamlin are, are both. Really? Yes. Huh. They didn't come across all Michigan, but I guess they are. <laughs> huh. What? Is that wrong? I'm in the South, baby. All you are Northerners with your negative five degrees. Oh, you, I live further north than Regina yet. I'm like four hours north of Regina. Oh, geez. Is that in the... <laughs> According to my computer, it is minus 22 Celsius right now. I don't know what that is. Cold. Cold. Okay, that's a good answer. You could have come back with many things. That was a nice answer. <laughs> How about this, Yankee? Learn the metric system. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the conversion to Fahrenheit either. Minus 40 is minus 40. That's about as far as we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know 16 is 61. That's the only thing I know. 16 Celsius is 61 yeah. Fahrenheit. 72 is plus 20-ish Celsius. Yeah. Well, it was 60 here yesterday, you cold people. Fahrenheit. <laughs> we I were in the 50s it. yesterday in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had one nice day. Well, we've had a few yeah. nice days. But... Yeah, they had tornadoes and crap south of me last night where those fronts are hitting. It's, it is what it is. It's like freaking 20 degrees, 30 degrees on the other side of this line. So Kansas City had a Super Bowl party and there weren't parkas. And we're, what, 195 miles away? And we're wearing shorts. It's weird. Anyway, I don't mean to take your time. I know you're busy. Again, I appreciate you listening. And I appreciate all of your time in continuing this mission. Okay, very much. All right. Have a wonderful day, you guys. I'll send you that stuff. Thank you. Care, Thanks, Patty. You're the greatest. And I mean that. Thank you. Talk to All you right, later. See ya. Bye. Hanging up now.